Awesome, awesome. Well, let's uh, let's dive in just a little bit to the word today. How does that sound? I think it sounds pretty good. Can somebody get me a tissue? I have a. I'm gonna blow my nose. You don't see this on Joel Osteen. I promise you that. Yeah, we should probably buy a box of tissues. Let's uh, somebody write that down, Dylan. I will most likely and most definitely forget. Thank you, Ben. Anybody watch now? There we go. All right. Awesome. All right. God is good. Amen. I feel the joy of the Lord in this place today. I love it. I love it. And uh, there is nothing better than joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Life is much too short to not live with joy. Uh, and it's not the joy that we could control or we can contain our, on our own, but it's the joy only found in Jesus alone. I just feel the joy in here today. And I thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for leading us and guiding us and speaking to us in where you're taking us. And obviously, uh, March is uh, Easter is the last Sunday of March this year, which is super weird. Um, so it is, I think it's like March 29th or something, the last Sunday this month, 30, 31st. Wow. There you go. Hey, maybe Jesus comes back. I don't know. Just kidding. Don't get all worried. Um, so we have five Sundays in the month of March and we just finished up. I'm sure every, I mean, you know, packed house today. Everybody must've known we finished up our series on giving. Just get everybody's like, finally, I'm time to go back to church. Sick and tired of hearing about these people talk about giving, but we are walking, well, we're going to do the entire month of March, five weeks. Obviously, the, uh, Palm Sunday and Easter are the layup sermons for a pastor. You know, it's like, man, you know, anybody can preach a, a Palm Sunday and Easter sermon. Um, it's pretty much given to us on a silver platter, but we're, we are going to, these next three weeks, walk with Jesus to the cross. The series that we're going to be in is called Eyes on Jesus. It's going to lead up to Easter, which we obviously know we have the victory. This is not like a movie we don't know the ending to. This is, in fact, one of those amazing movies we watch every time because we do know the ending, and it's one of those good ones, right? That's what we know as believers. And so we're going we're gonna to walk with Jesus through his life and through his ministry on earth. And we are going to take things that we can apply to our life. And we're just going to look at who he is as our perfect savior. Not only what he did for us and what he did on earth, but realizing as we look at this through the lens that he is doing these things as us. Right? When, when he's doing these for the very first time, we're wondering, why did Jesus get baptized? Why did he have to get baptized? Right? Right? Why did Jesus go into the wilderness to be tempted? Why did he do these things? He didn't need to go through these things. He didn't need temptation to grow. He didn't need baptism for forgiveness of sin. In fact, he had no sin. Remember, this is already a, a much later point in his life, right before his ministry starts. But now we know, because we know the ending of this, we know who we are. We now realize what he was doing all along. He was doing these things as us so we can now look back and have victory in the same things that he went through. He was baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Why? Not because he needed it, but because it was to fulfill, like he tells John, all righteousness. And now we get to look at that and say we get to receive that same spiritual baptism on the inside of us when we believe in Jesus. He's led into the wilderness to be tempted, not because he needs it, but to show us that we also have victory over temptation. To show believers the authority that we have on earth. It, 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 it boggles my mind that believers can live their life thinking they have no authority over the devil. In fact, the devil only has the power that we give him over our life and situation. It says he w walks about as a roaring lion. He is not a roaring lion. He walks about as one, seeking whom he may devour. I'm here to tell you today, he may not devour my family or myself. Do we understand the authority we have as believers and the way we understand it is looking at Jesus, our eyes on Jesus, our eyes on him. Do we see what he's doing? Do we see what he walked through for us and as us? He did not just die for us. He died as us. We are one. We understand to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. People say, well, why do some people get healed and some people pass away? Why do bad things happen to good people? We understand as believers that we do not lose. If we ascend to heaven, we understand to be absent from our bodies, to be present with the Lord. We are one spirit with him. 
We sit at the right hand of the Father as him, with him. It is so important that we grasp this today because while we're looking at the life of Jesus, we are going to find stark contrast with, with, we'll look at Adam in a second, but we see a lot of resemblance with what we go through today. And you may read and ask yourself, why did Jesus go through this? Why is Jesus talking about this? Why? For us and as us. Amen? So let's look today. I'm, I, I, we'll preface really quick. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, this is when John baptizes Jesus. What we see here is this is the start of Jesus' ministry on earth. This is the beginning of the end for him. The, the, the Gospels, it is explaining the start of his ministry to his death, burial, and resurrection. And so what happens in Matthew chapter 3 is that John baptizes Jesus. And I'm going to give you the quick version. Jesus comes from Galilee to be baptized by John the Baptist. And John looks at him and realizes the irony in the situation and says, what are, what are we doing here? You should be baptizing me. I should not be baptizing you. But Jesus answered him and said, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God. He saw the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit fire that came upon him to empower him for his ministry. This is the first time we see in Again, this is not, oh, well, you know, it's a spirit. And he, no, no, he saw the spirit of God. It was physical. He could see it. So the heavens opened. You see God. You see the spirit of God. And you see the Son. It's the first time we see the manifestation of the Trinity in the Gospels, in the Bible. We see them all together. And the spirit of God descends on him like a dove in a lighting upon him. We talk a lot about the Holy Spirit lately. This was not the spirit within him. He was baptized for the forgiveness of his sins, which would have been a spirit within him, which you could not receive the spirit within because Jesus had not resurrected yet. Amen. This is what he's doing is he's foretelling what would happen. So he's baptized for the salvation and forgiveness of sins, which is what happens when we believe in Jesus. And then the spirit comes upon him. Do we see this happening here? This is the empowerment that happens for Jesus to fulfill his ministry. And this is what a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Somebody needs to hear that today. You are the beloved child of a good father and he is pleased in you. He is pleased with you. So we see God approve of his son and empower him with the spirit of God in this moment. God so loved his son that he gave him all the world for his possession, but God so loved the world that he gave his son and all for its redemption. There is a reason that right after this, that same spirit that came upon him led him into the wilderness to be tempted. There's a reason. Why? Because the devil has no reason to tempt somebody that's not doing anything against his power and ministry, the ministry of death. The devil has no reason to mess with somebody that's not making waves for the kingdom of God. I promise you, the moment you decide to allow God to use you how he wants, in that song we were singing, God, make me an offering. Well, what is an offering? An offering, like we all understand in the physical, is, right, we give money, the church uses it to, to spread the gospel, to pay the bills, to have service. In fact, it's not our worry to worry about. We give to the Lord, and we allow the, the kingdom of God and who he's appointed to distribute those things, right? Okay, well, if that's the case with an offering, and we're singing these words, and we don't just sing these words because we want to, but we sing them because we believe them. We say, God, make me an offering. I want to be an offering to you. What? That means laying your life down, getting out of your way, and allowing God to do what he wants to do. We're okay to do it when it comes with giving the money because we don't see what happens, but are we okay to do it with our life? God, I want to be an offering to you which means getting out of what I want and what makes sense for me and what makes sense in the natural and aligning with what you want, and I just want my life to be what you want it to be. This is what's happening. Jesus is showing us what the life of his looked like and what ours gets to look like. There's a reason the temptation came after the ministry started. He's showing us as believers a progression of what happens. We give our life to Christ, and guess what? Things do not get easier. 
one thing we are promised is hardship. Things get harder. Why? Because there is a devil. And it's past time that we stop blaming God when bad things happen and instead understanding there is an adversary who wants us dead. So we get to see, man, we see this amazing thing happen, the start of this ministry, and right after the same spirit that came upon him leads him into temptation. So that's where we're going to be for a second here today. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. I'm going to read this. This is how I'm going to do this because we don't have a whole ton of time today. I'm going to read this through, and then I'm going to go to another verse, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to go back to this and kind of break this down really quick, and we'll be done today. It says this, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. I love that it adds that in there. So after he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, then he was hungry. I'm sorry, I just don't know if that's for me, Jesus. But I promise it is. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Okay, so we obviously see a lot is happening here, and we understand now that when we're looking at this and seeing this, Jesus is going through this temptation to show us the blueprint for what it should look like for us. Every single time the devil tempted him with something, what did he say? Well, I did this at for it is written. The way we combat temptation, the word of God. We have to know what this says. The devil lies to you. The devil comes in with temptation and it says, for it is written. This is the key. This is it. So let me read this. Let me go down. I'm, I'm going to be jumping around. Jonathan, I'm sorry. We're all over the place. First John chapter 2, verse 15. And it says this, do not love the world or the things in the world. And again, we're not talking about the world that God created, the cosmos that he gave his son to. He's talking about the ways of the world now. Listen, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, listen to this, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So we understand as believers, once we receive Jesus, we are in the will of God. We abide forever in him. What we're seeing here is that the devil tempts the same way. He tempted Adam in the garden the same way that he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. The same things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so when we look at Adam, where am I at here? Let's find Adam. When we look at Adam, we see that he fell in a garden, in the Garden of Eden. A garden that was very pleasing to the eye. Romans 5, 18 and 19 says this, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all, which is Adam, the first Adam, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. So we see Adam fall in the garden, but we see Jesus succeed in the wilderness. And we're going to look really quickly at the stark contrast of these two things here. It says this. Let 
I'm a, I'm here we are. Let's see. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Bear with me, people. You remember what we're talking about today? Did you already forget? Hmm. All right. So we're going to look quickly at the stark contrast between Adam and Jesus. We see that Adam in the garden, Eden, meant pleasure. So he's looking at this through his eyes. So the first thing the enemy comes with is the lust of the flesh, what it looks like. And we see Adam eat from a tree that looked like life and it brought death for everybody. And what we see thousands of years later is Jesus die on a dead tree that brought life to everybody. Do we see that the, the enemy has no new tactics and the reason that Jesus went into the wilderness instead of a beautiful garden is because the garden that he wants is to be on the inside of us. He is the gardener. So what's happening is he goes into the wilderness and the devil comes to him and tempts him. And we're going to look at the same three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so it says this. In uh, Matthew chapter 4, we're going back now. We're going to go through it again and we're going to break it down. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said to him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the first thing the devil tempts him with is the lust of the flesh. See, the devil knew he had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And the first thing he does is he appeals to the flesh. What feels good, what benefits me now in this moment, what, what works for me right now. Man, I know you're hungry. Look at this, Just If you are the son of God, turn this stone into bread. Why? Because it will feed you and fill you now. You will have instant gratification. You'll have instant relief. If you're the son of God, do this. The devil will always offer us an easier way out than the cross. Always. Verse 5, then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So now we see he hits him with the pride of life. If you truly are the son of God, well, jump off this. Show everybody. Obviously, you have the power. You're, nothing's gonna happen to you. We see in our world today, the American church, and as people in a whole, our world teaches and preaches independence. You can do it on your own. You do not need anybody else. It's one thing that I talked to somebody about what, what COVID really did and what really hurt the church is that it got people comfortable just staying at home and doing church in their own confines, safe and comfortable, isolated. Well, I could just do this on my own. I don't have to go to church. I am the church. We're missing the point. But it, at the end of the day, that's what our world preaches and teaches is independence. What can you do for yourself? How can you benefit you? What can you do that brings you gratification and gets you a leg up and puts you in a place above somebody else? This is not about our independence. It's solely about dependence on Jesus alone. In fact, we cannot do a little bit. We can't do a portion we can't say, hey, God, I'll, you do half, I'll do half. In fact, we couldn't do any of it. Nothing. Only Jesus. So it's breaking this mold, the, 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 the pride of life, feeling like there's something we could possibly do and, and, and we can get it done and we could bring this about for us. Well, on the flip side of that, that means that it's the same conversation we've had countless times, right? Do people that commit suicide go to hell? If there is something you could do, right, okay, let me make this clear. People that are saved, right, believe in Jesus, that then commit suicide, do they go to hell? This is what I say every time. If there is something that we could possibly do by our action that could take away 
what Jesus paid for, that means that we have more power than Jesus' death on the cross. That means by our action, we received our salvation, which means by our action, we could lose our salvation. But as believers, we understand what? We received a free gift paid for in blood by somebody that wasn't us. We get to receive it, which means we can't lose it. You cannot lose something you didn't earn or pay for. In fact, the word of God says nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing. That means even us and our action and our mistakes. Nothing. Verse 8 says this, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, and he showed him all the kingdom of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. And this is the lust of the flesh. The American church has sold out for relevance, and the believers and the next generation are the ones who will pay the price. You see it all across the nation. You see right after in 2020, you see these cultural movements and these progressive ideologies and these things that represent people and not God. And now people need to identify with something or pick a side. And every single one of those things ends up pointing our life back to us. What's my title? What's my gender? What, what side of the aisle do I stand on? This is me. Every single one of those things points back to us and does not point to Jesus. But that's what the enemy does. Those are the enemy's tactics. So we see the American church crumble under the weight of this. Why? Oh, maybe, maybe no backbone is the, for starters. But what we see is people that don't have a revelation of the grace and goodness of who God is fall away under the pressure of the world because the lust of the flesh says bend the knee to the woke mob and relevance is what you'll have. We've seen countless times and unfortunately it's, uh, it's just one of those tough things that makes it hard but it's what happens when we hold pastors and treat them like celebrities and hold them on a pedestal because they're just human like everybody else and they have the furthest to fall when they make a mistake. We do not sell out for relevance. In fact, people aren't going to like what we say. The truth hurts, but the truth is who Jesus is. There's only one way into heaven, and it's through him. And the amazing thing is the truth we preach, you would be shocked with how many more people have an issue with us telling people that God is good. In fact, they would rather us say, God is angry with you, he's mad at you, you better give, you better be in church, because if you're not, who knows, maybe he turns his back on you today. Which, by the way, you can't find any of that in here. Not, not one instance, ever. There's just something so real about letting go of anything in our life that can lead back to us having the glory and, and having the gratification. It has to be Jesus and only him. And like we understand, he is in us and we are in him and we are one. I think, I'm pretty sure I have the verse in here. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. It's the reason why, why, why Jesus shows up on the road when Paul is going to persecute believers. It's the reason Jesus stops him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting those who follow me and my believers? Why are you persecuting me? Because we are one with Christ, and that's him, that's his life that's being taken. 
Jesus steps in because we are in him and he is in us. We are one. The whole point of this, the whole point of this is that Jesus shows us what Adam couldn't show us, and it is overcoming temptation. See, Adam had everything out there. He was in the garden. It was, I mean, all good things. It was awesome. You see, because what God wants is God wants us to be pleased. He wants us to have everything he's desired for us. But we see what happened is that the same way the serpent comes to Adam, to uh, the first Adam to tempt him, he succumbs to it. And this is why Jesus had to go to the wilderness. Because he had to show us the right way and the right Adam. This is the start of his ministry, of going all the way to his death and resurrection, crucifixion, crucifixion, resurrection as us and for us. And we know that Jesus is the second Adam. We know that he did this for us, but let's not miss the fact that he went all the way back to the beginning. And before his ministry started, he said, I'm not just going to die and do all this. I'm going to show you how to overcome what the first Adam couldn't. So what does this mean for us now? It means that what Jesus did in the wilderness was for us and as us, which means we have victory and authority over temptation. The amazing thing about the grace of God is even when we succumb to temptation, because I'll be the first to tell you that 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 happens. Unless you're in here and you're perfect. In that case, you just lied, so now, hey, jump in with with the group. The grace of God is not something that, uh, I've said this before, and a lot of times people mix up and misunderstand grace and salvation, and that salvation is once for all. For all. You believe in Jesus. You believe in here that he is who he says he is. He died for you. He rose everything. He, he was killed. He was buried. He rose again, and he's alive today, and you're saved to believe one time. People think the grace of God is like that. Man, I just take my one dose of grace. Thank you. Grace is something we lavish on ourselves every single waking moment of the day because we cannot do anything God has called us to do without it. We can't. And so what we do is we renew our mind daily to this. You should come to temptation. Thank you, Jesus, for doing it for me and as me. And because of you, I have victory. It's never going to look perfect. Jesus is not looking for perfection. Why? Because he was perfection. And if he was looking for perfection, he'd be looking for another savior. There's only one. It is his victory, and in turn, it's our victory. Amen? Isn't that good news today? So, team, you could come up. We'll close this morning. I hope this has spoken to you. I assure you it's spoken to me. We have an amazing ability in front of us. That is to have authority to trample over snakes and serpents, to have authority over temptation, to know what God has called us to, to know who we are in Christ, to know that what Jesus did, he won for us and as us. That he's not asking us to be independent. He's not, he's not asking us to make up new, reinvent the wheel. He's saying, just let me use you. Will we allow our life to be an offering to him? Will we allow our life to look the way he wants it to look? Which means fully surrendering to him. Going through the, the discomfort and the growth and the expansion that comes with surrendering your life to Jesus. I promise it's not comfortable. It's not always comfortable. In fact, it would be the opposite of comfortable. There's worry. How are we gonna how are we gonna pay the bills? How are we gonna do this? But guess what? God is good. We never trade what we know about God for what we do not understand. I'm gonna say that again. We do not trade what we know about God for what we do not understand. 